on the docket. That is case number 115531, Lori Leanne Manley et al. v. Stephen B. Hallbauer and Kathy M. Hallbauer in Lamette County. Good morning. Uh, I'm Angela Spigarelli. I'm here representing the appellate Lori Leanne Manley. Um, if I could, I'd like to just take 13 minutes and two for the rebuttal, if that's possible. Two Don't know if I need it, but... Two minutes for rebuttal is granted. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the issue in this case is really specific. Um, it is whether a rural landowner has a duty to cut down trees on their property that created an obstructed view for drivers at the adjacent intersection. Um, so, in order to understand that issue, I want to talk about the facts of the case. Um, this involves an unsigned, unmarked intersection in Labette County. Um, so, it's also a gravel road and it's in a rural area. So, the defendant landowners owned the property um, on the uh, this northeast quadrant. So the problem and the reason that um, we're here today is because the landowners had a condition on their property that basically, and this is in our description, the investigating officer described it as 0% visibility because they had a row of trees about 50 or 60 feet going north and south and 50 or, 50 or 60 feet going uh, east and west. So the two drivers approach, our drivers going north, other driver going west, they approach the intersection at the same time and with no visibility, the evidence shows neither one of them even applied the brakes. Um, and they had a collision at that intersection and unfortunately our client is deceased now. The um, description of the trees makes it sound like it's a windrow type of situation where somebody actually planted trees in a row. These are natural trees. So. These, These are natural trees. So this is not landscaped? It's not landscaping. And that's important because the court made a distinction about that. And these are natural trees. They were there when the landowners bought the property. Okay, so... Um, it's more a grove of trees than two lines. I'm sorry? It's more a grove of trees yes, or it, woods than two lines. It is. Lines, I would sorry. describe it as woods, yes. Um, and if you, if the accident report shows it as a complete blockage of view, it looks like a forest, basically. Um, so, um, the other driver testified he never, he didn't even, he knew there was an intersection, but never saw the other driver, our client, until he hit him. Our client wasn't familiar with that intersection, so he didn't even know if there was an intersection. And again, it's unmarked. So, um, the... District court, or the, yeah, the district court said that a landowner has no duty to trim their trees. Uh, a rural landowner has no duty to trim their trees, no duty to the drivers on an adjacent road. And the appellate court agreed with the district court, and uh, they said that also the landowner has no duty. So I need to mention that we also, in the mix, is the county. We put the county in there, it's Labette County who had the duty to um, take care of that roadway. So the, the only person that was granted immunity basically was the landowner. The county was not. So they were still in the mix. Um, and the appellate Well, that, court, wasn't, that wasn't immunity. That was the finding that landowners, because uh, Court action, you have to first establish that there's a duty. Correct. And someone that owns land owns a duty to someone that's driving a vehicle. Right. And here wasn't the finding that there was no duty owed. Now, maybe a duty from the county mm -hmm. because the county is maintaining the roadway. Yes. But but that's not immunity. It has the effect of it, and and, and the reason that we're here today is obviously because what the 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 party that created the dangerous condition or the hazard was granted immunity. In other words, the court I thought decided... You said that, I thought you said these landowners didn't create that, that that was a natural phenomenon. Let me, get, let me tell you more about that, too. 
Um, there, the landowners testified that they under they testified they knew it was a hazard, and in fact they were taking steps to correct it. They had bought it in 2006, and year after year after year for about four years, five years, they were trying to cut it back, but they just never got it done. So both Mr. Halbar and Mrs. Halbar testified they knew it was a dangerous intersection. They were taking steps to correct it. In fact, Mrs. Halbar said she wished there was a stop sign at that intersection because they both knew it was dangerous. That was my next question, is if you have a natural phenomenon or even if you have a man-made, like a, if you have a, a huge building, uh, or a complex of buildings that would obstruct the view in the same manner, um, or if you had, if it was cropland that 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 grows corn, um, that would have the same effect, correct? Uh, well, there's a difference between um, rural and urban. So urban, if you're in the city and you and there's a uh, tree blocking, there could be liability for that. But what the court said here is there's absolutely no liability in a rural setting for a natural condition. So that's the really specific issue we're talking about. What if the terrain blocked the vision? There's a, a, a big man, uh, just uh, something in the terrain that blocks the vision in the same manner the, the grove of trees did. Yes. Is, there, is there some sort of obligation to, to uh, remove the, the dirt or the rock or some sort of other natural obstruction? It appears not. That's, that's why, why, why. So what's the difference? So the difference is, and the, uh, the uh, the Court of Appeals applied restatement of tort second, section 363, which states a rural landowner has no liability for injury to those outside the land, so off the land, which is caused by a natural condition. So rocks would be a natural condition. Absolutely no liability. And that's why I called it immunity, because they're just taken out of the mix. County isn't, but they were. So what we asked the court to do was to apply restatement third of torts, which is section 54 which imposes a duty of reasonable care only if the landowner knows of the risk and the risk is obvious. So for some reason, the Court of Appeals thought that that was in contravention to Kansas law because it doesn't use a foreseeability analysis. But we disagree. Um, this, this restatement of third torts only imposes liability if the owner knew of the risk and it was obvious. And we had testimony that they did know both husband and wife knew it was a dangerous condition. So the reason the court gave for applying the second restatement of torts and not the third was because the third restatement is contrary to Kansas law because it doesn't use foreseeability analysis. Well, the the, the very fact that they require the landowner to know of the of the hazardous condition, and in this case we did, isn't that foreseeability? If they don't know of it and it's not obvious, then, I mean, it could be a case-by-case -case basis. Rather than ma making it a matter of law that a landowner can never be liable in the, if they create a hazard, a hazard they knew about, doesn't it make more sense to take it as a case-by-case -case basis and let the jury decide? If, it, if they don't think it's foreseeability, or foreseeable that that an accident can happen, then so be it. But we think that at least it should be a possibility for all of their faults to be compared. Doesn't the second restatement comments seem to indicate that the policy behind um, that the position is that a rural landowner may have a an, an lot of property to have to deal with, where an urban landowner just has a lot. Yeah. Um, and um, that it's really kind of a policy um, and that people in the rural area understand that you are going to have hazards such as growing crops or other things. Um, and, it, and doesn't that seem to be a policy that underlies the Kansas cases as well? It does, and, it, and there's gonna be a lot of rural landowners obviously in Kansas versus another state. But um, again, we think it's fair if the, if the landowner knows about the hazard, is aware of it, and even taking steps to correct it, that at least their faults should be able to be compared. Compared with the, the driver, the other driver, the county who was supposed to be taking care of, of that particular road. Um, it just doesn't make sense in this case where the landowners have actual knowledge to use a foreseeability analysis. 
when there's actual knowledge. We're past foreseeability. Well, what doesn't make sense to me is to require a, a grove of trees to be cut down when the situation could be remedied with a stop sign. And, Agreed. And a sign that says obstructed intersection ahead. Agree. I agree. But I, I don't believe that that means that the land order, landowner should be taken out of the equation altogether. Just a house cleaning matter. What was the speed limit on those roads? Was that part of the... I, I believe it was 35. 35? I think so. And was there some type of expert testimony about the speed of the vehicles going 45 or approximately 40? I, I, that sounds right. And um, again, I'm not saying that the... the, the Driver's negligence can be compared to. No, I understand yeah. that. I'm just trying mm -hmm. to get. Uh, yeah, understand it was this. a gravel dirt road, and I do think it was. I, I think I have 35 in my head. My, I, okay. I may be off on that, Thank but um, and that's another factor too. We've got gravel, we've got unsigned, and we've got zero visibility, and so it was the uh, perfect atmosphere for something like this to happen. Um. Again, the third restatement simply states that all landowners should be held to a general duty of reasonable care only if they are aware of a hazard and, um, and knew about it. So, um, the, like I said, the county did not get immunity, so why would the landowner whose hazardous condition caused the accident because the landowners aren't charged with the responsibility of maintaining the road. That's the county's uh, responsibility. The landowners are charged with the responsibility of maintaining the property. So you're wanting to make them uh, uh, jointly liable with the county for the maintenance of the road, really, for maintaining a safe road. Well, And that's the difference. Yeah. We have direct responsibility versus like uh, carious responsibility or, or uh, uh, indirect responsibility? Um, we think it's a direct responsibility. If you're right there on the corner and you're creating a hazard for drivers. But it wouldn't be a hazard if there was a stop sign. Would you agree? Yes. So uh, Actually, both. If there was a stop sign, there wouldn't be a hazard. If there were trees and no stop sign, there wouldn't be a hazard. So again, why not compare the fault of all parties? Or you could say, hey, why didn't our driver slow down? Or why didn't the other driver slow down? Or why didn't he yield? Simply asking that all the parties fault be compared. If you think about it, we have two landowners that testified. They had knowledge that that was a, a hazardous intersection. And the Court of Appeals said, well, we don't know if it was foreseeable or not. We have to use a foreseeability analysis. How does that make sense? Okay, and um, we're simply asking that by using the third restatement of torts, you can do both. You can use a foreseeability analysis and the jury can decide whether the landowner should have responsibility or not. And you can also uh, assign um, liability to them if you find out that they had knowledge, which in this case they did. Does that conclude your presentation? Yes, thank you. Do we have any further questions? Thank you, Council. Thank you. May it please the court, Vince Wheeler for uh, Stephen and Kathy Hallbauer. Uh, this court has decided two previous cases that uh, involve whether a landowner may be liable to highway users for failure to cut vegetation. And those cases were discussed in the briefs. They are Goodale versus Cowley County and Baum versus Reset. Those cases say that vegetation on private property cannot be the proximate cause of an intersection collision. And the rationale that I glean from that is that the trees on the private property are a mere condition and not the producing cause of an accident. Now it's true that those cases are both about 90 years old, uh, but the definition of proximate cause now is the same as it was then, 
and lack of proximate cause now is the same as it was then. So I think conceivably those old cases do end the discussion. However, the Court of Appeals did not quite think that. The Court of Appeals did say they thought those cases were a factor in the way that they decided the case, but they also analyzed the case on the issue of whether or not there was a duty involved on the part of the Harlbauers. Kansas law provides that a duty arises when probability of harm is reasonably foreseeable. Not the possibility of harm, but the probability. Some substantial likelihood of harm. The relevant facts here are these. This was a rural intersection, and it was about a rural intersection as you could possibly imagine. Uh, these are two very low volume roads, they're gravel roads. Uh, this intersection had undoubtedly been there for decades. The trees uh, on the Holbauer's property, which again they did not plant, and as far as we know no one planted, uh, had all, also apparently been there for decades. And until this accident occurred in 2011, there had never been an automobile collision at that intersection. This accident was not reasonably probable to occur as the Court of Appeals found. Uh, it was, in essence, basically a remote possibility. Would it, make, would it make a difference if there had previously been an accident at that low volume? I mean, I'm, I'm with you on the low volume road part, mm -hmm. but had there been an accident there, would that make a difference? Well, one could certainly say it would make it more foreseeable, I guess, in, that, in, in a sense. I'm just reading the, the, the way, that it, assuming we stick with the restatement second, I'm trying to figure out how much has to happen before you get over the line with the restatement yeah, I don't know second, I, and I can't come up with it. It just seems I like... Right. No I don't duty. think there's a bright line there. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't. And given that, I, I guess the, 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 the main argument on plaintiff's side is that why not let a jury decide this? You've got low, you know, you've got your side, low volume, never had an accident there, the landowner had never been told there was a threat, they yeah. might have perceived one, but were never told by some authority that there's a threat. So those are all good things for you, but they have some good things also. Why not just let the jury compare fault? Well, a jury would compare fault if there were a question of negligence, but obviously uh, question, the duty question is, is for the court to decide initially. And uh, if there's no duty, there's no negligence. And if there's no negligence, then there's no comparative negligence. Uh, that's, that would be my position on it, uh, that we have to start with duty. And if we have duty, then we proceed to the question of whether or not there is negligence and whether a jury decides. If we don't have duty, then at the outset, we don't have a decidable question. Have I... Have I addressed Right, but if you don't have a duty, I'm not sure any of the other facts make any difference. I agree with that. If the county would have come in and said, trim your trees under the statute, then the duty arises. I believe, it, I believe there is a duty. Now, I believe you're, re you're referencing possibly KSA 8-2011. That's right, yes. Right. Uh, there is a duty under that statute to trim, uh, and if you don't trim, you get fined. There have been a couple of cases saying that that particular statute does not give rise to a private cause of action. Um, so yeah, That's really not my question. I'm just following up on Justice Biles. If the county would have come in and said, trim your trees, we think it's a, a problem here. Would the duty arise? It'd be a closer question. <laughs> okay, it sure would, yeah. Uh, and I, I, quite frankly, I don't know of a single case in Kansas where a landowner's been sued after being told by the county they needed to trim their trees. So I don't think that case has been decided. So, uh, so is that something that, that, at least in terms of civil liability, that the landowner can just ignore the counties telling them to do it? Uh, I guess that's for the court to decide. I guess <laughs> perhaps that's some future uh, in some future case where that fact situation would arise. Um, you know, I, I think I, I think I would come down on the side of if the county says you do it, you better do it. I think I would. Uh, the cases that have been decided, the county never said that. The allegation was simply, we've got a statute, that, and the plaintiff says, okay, that statute gives rise to a duty, but the county never came in and said, we've an analyzed this situation, and you've got a problem. What do we make of the caveats that are in, in the restatement second? 
about trees and including trees in rural conditions. I mean, basically they say, we're not taking a position on that. And in the, the last part of the restatement comments, they then cite a number of cases from other jurisdictions where it, there does appear to be some duty if it's a, uh, they, they make a distinction between a duty of inspection and, but once something is revealed to be a, an obstruction, then there is a duty to do something about it. Uh, I may not be familiar with the line of cases that you're referencing there, Your Honor. Okay. Um, it's, just, it's just the last part of the restatement. And uh, the caveat is the Institute takes no position as to whether the rule stated in subsection 2 will apply to the possessor of a land in a rural area whose trees endanger the safety of travelers on the highway. I, yeah, I, I saw that too. And, you know, to me, that, to me that was somewhat referencing a situation where you have trees that are, that are confined to the land, but perhaps they fall off into the road. And, and an accident results because of that. Trees that were on the land and then, I, I couldn't make sense of that particular caveat any other way. Uh, that possibly some damage was done where, and, and again, where tr perhaps hanging branches or something and fall off into a public area that injures someone or, or causes an accident. Well, well, what about that scenario? Well, let's say a hanging branch, the tree grows, I know, some trees grow faster than others, but the yeah. tree grows to the point where it is a hanging branch is, is comes within contact of a farm equipment that's driving down the road or something else that would cause damage. Is, mm -hmm. Even in that scenario, mm -hmm. given this, there's no duty on the on the landowner's part to, to, I don't, to uh, no, I think remedy there is. that situation? I think there is. I think that the cases that I've seen come down on the side that if if what's growing on the landowner's property has actually left the property, is growing right. across. And I think that's what you're talking about. Uh, or parts of the landowner's property have fallen off into the road or onto somebody else's property. And I think you have a different situation there. Uh, the trees in this case were confined to the property on which we're discussing. Um, and yeah, I will just mention this. I mean, the Court of Appeals did um, discuss the application of the second restatement versus third restatement. And we can obviously get into that, but again, I'm not sure that we really need to, to discuss that as long as lack of foreseeability is controlling the issue in this case. Uh, and I'd be happy to discuss the, the third restatement, but I mean, I, I think Judge Levin is correct that uh, the third restatement just totally ignores foreseeability as an element of duty and makes the landowner liable for every single risk that the landowner may perceive, regardless of what a remote possibility there may be of it causing some kind of a problem down the line. And that's not been Kansas law, and it hasn't been Kansas law as far as I know forever. Um, and I'd also note that Section 54 that uh, Judge Lieben uh, discussed of the third restatement, I I've done a search on that, and I had an associate do a search on that, and neither one of us have been able to find a single state that has applied Section 54, uh, well, has, has approved of Section 54. And I found one state that's discussed it to much disapproval, uh, but nobody has applied it. Uh, yeah, there's one other issue I would like to just touch on that the Court of Appeals didn't talk about, um, and that's public policy. <clears throat> Is there a public policy uh, against imposing a duty in this case? Uh, and, of course, the court may choose uh, not to recognize a duty that is contrary to public policy. And the argument is this. Uh, Kansas is essentially a rural state. Uh, most of our land is rural land. There are undoubtedly uh, dozens, if not perhaps hundreds, of intersections in every county uh, of this state, particularly the rural counties, that, is, uh, that are in some way obstructed by either naturally growing trees or shelter belt or hedgerow or wheat that grows up to the road or corn that grows up to the road, all of which has great utility to landowners uh, in Kansas, farmers, ranchers, etc. Is it in the best interest of this state to subject all of those people to potential liability for every open intersection accident that occurs near their property? And, and I would submit that it isn't. I mean, not only is it uh, a terrific burden in terms 
of increased litigation costs, but it's, uh, it's a burden on the very folks that we're trying to help out in this state and that support our state. Uh, and I, I sincerely believe that allowing a landowner to be sued under these facts creates uh, future cases that will do more harm than good. Um, so if the court has further questions, I'd certainly entertain them. Uh, and if not, I would say that for the reasons stated and for the reasons stated also by the Court of Appeals, we would ask that uh, the judgment of the district court be affirmed. Thank you. Do we, do we have any more questions? How do you balance your public policy argument with the notion that you're doing it on the backs of injured plaintiffs? Well, it is a balance. Uh, it is a balance. Well, we like farmers more than we like injured drivers on rural roads. I represent a lot more farmers, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, now, I know that's not much of an answer. And I think it's a, you know, as you point out, I mean, it's, uh, it's a tough balance. But when we look at the other issues that are involved here and uh, the, the lack of foreseeability issue, uh, the restatement second issue that was pointed out by the, by the Court of Appeals, which in which the, the common law rule was that naturally occurring conditions on the property uh, were not subject uh, to liability. I think when we combine all of those, then the balance, in my opinion, comes down in favor, in favor of the rural landowners. Well, well Counselor, isn't the balance also, we're not balancing injured people against landowners, we're balancing who has the duty to drivers, the automobile drivers. Correct. Because uh, the county undoubtedly has the duty to maintain the road, mm -hmm. has the uh, ability to put regulatory signs or uh, obstructions to protect drivers, and also has statutory authority to direct landowners to do things to their property to make it's safe. And so it's not injured parties versus farmers, it's counties versus landowners. Who's going to be uh, uh, bear the burden uh, uh, when, party, when people are injured? Yes, right. And, you know, and all of which could have been done here. I mean, the county could have given notice. Uh, county could have put up a stop sign. Uh, plaintiffs admit that. And they could have told these people to cut their trees down. Could have done that. Yeah, and, and under the statute at that point, they'd have been obligated to do that or they would have faced a penalty. Any more questions? Getting to, on your public policy argument, I, 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 I took your argument to recognize the, the truth, which is that this court doesn't make public policy. The folks across the street do. I, so I, I, that's the way I took your argument. But what would you point to that says the public policy of the state is that these landowners not have a duty to uh, avoid situations like this. I think other courts that have looked at that have looked at the the, the agrarian nature of of the area versus the urban nature of the area. Well, but I mean, again, public policy has to be expressed and it gets expressed across the street. It doesn't get expressed here. So, I mean, it doesn't matter whether we like farmers better than, than counties yeah. or whatever. Um, so what would you point to as being actions, let's say by the legislature, that would evidence the public policy that you think we should recognize when we're trying to figure out who has a duty? Perhaps, that, perhaps they've done that in, uh in the statute that we've already discussed, 8-2011. There is no other, um, there's no other law in the state that says landowners have a duty other than that statute which, which the legislature passed. I see my time is up. Any more questions? Thank you, Council. Thank you. I just really, I wanted to quickly point out that we did have testimony from um, the Labette County. Um, she, her name was Sandra Kreider. She's in charge of the roads. Not to confuse the issue, but they had actually traded with Montgomery County that particular part of the road. They can do that by contract. But she testified, had she seen that corner looking like that, she would have notified the landowner and told him to cut it down. 
Um, again, she they had traded that. But so let's think through that. So she notifies the defendants to cut it down, and then they don't. And then this accident happens. And so then what? They get a fine and, and, and still no liability because that's what's going to happen. Even if the county did tell them to cut it down, they can tell them to cut it down a bunch of times. And um, if an accident like this occurs, there's no liability for them. Um, and then lastly, I too did a search to see, hey, who's been adopting this section of the restatement third? Um, and it, it's mentioned three times, but and we're one of them, by the way. But the reason is because, and the reason that this restatement third came about is because the modern trend in case law is to change from this illogical result to holding them to a reasonable care standard landowners that is so it's not that nobody's adopting restatement third it's that the case law is naturally trending that way and their fault is compared just like anybody else's did your claim against the county involve um, allegations that the county failed to comply with the uniform manual for this particular yes. low volume road there, there should have been some signage is what we alleged okay. either stop sign or warning sign that it was an unsigned intersection and cutting down some of the, because some of the um, trees are both outside the fence line and inside the defendants. And the, and the signage claim was based on the uniform manual? Yes. Okay. And there was some discussion about whether they, um, if they, if it's discretionary on a rural boat or a low volume road, and we never got to hash all of that out, but yes, that was the issue. If you've got that claim against the county, doesn't that show... Uh, because the uniform manual is um, required by law to be complied with. Doesn't that tell us where the legislature thought the responsibility ought to be for road hazards at that intersection? Yes, and they almost got there on landowners too by imposing a fine, but we're just asking that they can be have civil liability too, mm -hmm. not just a fine. They thought about it. In the statute, just didn't get far enough. Any more questions? I see none. Thank you, Council. Thank you. We appreciate the arguments of all Council this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.